but we're really excited for today's event. And I'm going to turn it over to Brett to introduce our speaker. All right. Well, thank you all for taking the time to be here today. Um, it's a joy to see a lot of familiar faces. And it's also a joy to have the founder of Geneva in our midst, Jason <laughs> Chen. So, I mean, yeah, I think it's kind of yeah. So Jason founded Geneva, I think it was what, 52 years ago? Does that sound right? So you were 10 when you started it, right? <laughs> yeah. um, and, uh, and so what we're doing here with the Field and Faith Forum is just kind of resurrecting what Jason started with the Finding God at Iowa series. We just gave it a new alliterative name, uh, but essentially it's the same uh, template. And we're doing this with uh, InterVarsity Christian Graduate Fellowship Ministries with Kevin Coomer, who has been here also uh, for a few years, right? 26 years. 26 years. Uh, and Ke Kevin, you have a few things you want to share real quick? I just wanted to say that uh, today, um, a couple things make me feel my age. Uh, I read the path of the psalm that talks about, uh, Lord, uh, uh, I have known you since my youth, and uh, now to gray hair and old age, please don't abandon me until I declare your glorious in the next generation. So I was reading that today, and you know, well, I'm with gray hair, white hair, so I was feeling quite old about that. The other thing, though, is is that I can remember um, when we had Kerry Covington uh, presenting, and so, um, you know, kind of the kinds of things I think that Derek um, addresses, and the kind of questions he gets asked are reminiscent of Kerry, uh, former Geneva campus ministry person and speaker of these events. So, um, but I also feel a bit like a bridge. I didn't know that Jason's going to be here, so he's the real bridge. But uh, so the past, you know, it's still, I don't know, it's coming full circle, but this is a continuation of that, and I'm excited about that fact and looking forward to the next generation there. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, we are very uh, honored and privileged to have uh, Derek Muller with us today. So, Derek, uh, apart from being a third and fourth grade girls soccer coach of the Yellow Jackets, right? Yeah. He's also a professor in the College of Law. Um, I have a script here that I should read from before I get anything else wrong. Uh, but he holds the, uh, the Ben V. Willie Professorship in Excellence here at the university. Uh, he's nationally recognized uh, for his work uh, in election law. His research focuses on the role of states in the administration of federal elections the constitutional contours of voting rights and election administration, the limits of judicial power in the domain of elections, and the Electoral College. So Derek really has not been busy at all these past four, eight years. Um, no, that's not true. He's been busy. He's been uh, featured in the New York Times, and the Los Angeles Times, and the Wall Street <coughs> Journal. He's testified before Congress. Uh, he's also a contributor to the Election Law Blog. He's the co-author on a federal courts casebook published by Carolina Academic <coughs> Press. And he teaches election law, federal courts, civil procedure, and evidence. And so today, we are uh, delighted, Derek, that you're here, that you're talking about faith in elections, which maybe is a bit of a double entendre, we'll find out. Um, and so we want you all to, to obviously uh, take this time to hear uh, what Derek uh, has to say, but also, too, uh, to think of some questions for Derek as uh, we're going to offer about uh, 10 to 20 minutes of Q&A time. So don't let him off the hook. Don't let him get out of here uh, easily. Uh, let's uh, think of some good questions for uh, Derek as he uh, shares with us on faith and elections. Thank you, Derek. It's a real privilege to present here today, and especially to see such uh, history of Geneva here uh, in, the, in the audience, um, and also the, faith, the Field and Faith Forum in particular. It was great to hear Fred and, and launch this, this most recent iteration of the series, and I'm excited to see what this looks like at the University of Iowa uh, campus in the years to come. Uh, so this talk today is entitled Faith and Elections, and it really began as what would have been a talk at Wheaton College in the spring of 2020 that, uh, for understandable reasons, did not happen. But uh, it turned into an essay that I published with the Notre Dame Journal of Law, Ethics, and Public Policy. I then did get to present a, uh, a version of this uh, at Wheaton College this past fall um, with Steve Bretson and some great folks who were there in the political science department. Um, but things change over the years, and there's always something else to think about when it comes to election law. And um, it's a joke I can only share with this audience when I talk about election law. It's not about Calvinism, right? We are <laughs> talking about the rules uh, 
governing elections that we have in the United States. Um, and whenever I mention this, you know, as Brett opened, uh, people will say, oh, it's a really interesting time to be talking about election law. And I said, it's true, but people have been saying that to me every year for the last 15 years. Uh, it's just that whatever is interesting has changed on a year-to-year -year basis. Um, it's, it's really exciting to be part of a dynamic field like this. Um, so most of you, I think, are not attorneys, I know. John is and some others might be in the audience. Most of you are not attorneys and maybe only have a passing familiarity of what the Constitution or laws of the United States um, do in the area of elections or what the Supreme Court might have to say about it. Um, that's what we do have as Americans, I think, a great attachment to the Constitution um, for understandable reasons. When that work was completed in the summer of Philadelphia in 1787, there was this consensus reach that was pretty remarkable. Um, it was a fragile nation after the Revolution uh, under the Articles of Confederation, uh, a testament to the resiliency of that sort of nascent country, uh, and it's endured now for a very long time. Subject to change and amendments, but not so malleable as a parchment barrier, uh, and remains our abiding reminder that we are a nation of laws and not of men. When we think about the Constitution, and we often think about the parts uh, maybe in 1787, but often it's amendments, the freedom of speech, the free exercise of religion, later amendments on due process and equal protection, but really the heart of the Constitution, so maybe surprisingly, if you read it, uh, lies in two elements, thinking about the separation of powers and also the, the, the notion of enumerated powers in the Constitution. Um, but the Constitution also has a very lot to say about elections. Who's going to serve in this new government with this tremendous responsibility and power? How would this new government be formed? Um, the Constitution has a lot to say about it. Probably not the first thing we think about it, maybe not its defining characteristic, um, but just as important to the framers in 1787 and to the many amendments that have come after it are the things that talk about elections in that Constitution. Um, so, you know, tonight, go home, leaf through the Constitution, maybe yourself, and see how many things are talking about who serves in Congress, for how long, how are they chosen, how do we determine how many are elected to Congress, what can those people in Congress do? We can ask this about the presidency, and while not elected in the federal courts, line after line, many of our amendments, including the 15th Amendment, 19th Amendment, 24th, 26th Amendment, these are all times we change the Constitution specifically to address questions of elections, including enfranchisement, and that's not I'm talking about the other structural changes, like the 12th Amendment changing the nature of the Electoral College. So just gobs and gobs of election law built into the Constitution. So the unmistakable pattern that we've seen over the years in the United States, um, although not exclusively linear, uh, has been the expansion of suffrage. More people than ever are eligible to vote, such that we have approached what we might label as near universal suffrage. More offices than ever are subject to vote, including many states' local judges, one of the most quintessentially eight political offices. We often vote on legislation more than ever, thanks to ballot initiative and referendum. It is, as a practical matter, easier to vote than at any time in human history. No excuse absentee voting, days of early voting, drop boxes, after election day ballot deadlines, generous review of absentee ballot signatures, same day registration, provisional ballots that can be cured, extremely accurate machines to tabulate ballots, and internet information about candidates are just things of this 21st century alone in terms of the developments relating to elections. So despite the fact that more people than ever vote on more things than ever, in more ways than ever, um, we are in an age of great skepticism. In fact, maybe you're even skeptical of some of the claims I just made about the breadth of voting opportunities and enfranchisement. Uh, it seems unusual given how much we've expanded those opportunities over the years and apparently trust in the political process, trust that more people are deciding more things than ever in more ways than ever. Um, but maybe it's a different reason that we have this skepticism. It might well be that the stakes are, or at least appear to be, so very high, as elected officials appear to do more than ever. Maybe it's our intense era of polarization, where it always seems like the other political party stands against everything our political party holds dear. In other words, we too easily live lives of fear. As a scholar of election law, I found conversations about the law increasingly devolving, if I can put it that way, into fearful hypotheticals. Um, when I testified before Congress last year on amending the Electoral Count Act of 1887, how Congress goes about counting electoral votes for president and count, uh, ascertaining a winner on uh, January 6th, I was pleased to see it enacted in December, or I speak at panels or student groups about partisan gerrymandering or about litigation surrounding elections. 
uh, and about election integrity, about fraud, about suppression. I want to talk about the process, the rules, the law. But of course, these rules lead to outcomes. And the rules aren't perfect. And there are bad actors who can exploit these rules. So the questions flow, what if this happens? What if that happens? If people seek to abuse the process, how can the law prevent it, if at all? And sometimes I tell people that the law might simply run out. <laughs> We're in situations of civil war or martial law at some point in time. But people, for, for some reason or another, have these increasingly fearful hypotheticals. And I think there's something lurking here. And that's why I've entitled this lecture, Faith in Elections, because we are suffering I think a crisis of faith, if I can use that word, in America, and not necessarily religious faith, although the theologians or sociologists in the room might have thought about this and have different thoughts on it. But I want to talk about the faith in elections. And recent surveys before elections uh, in recent years indicate that a plurality of Americans lack the confidence in the honesty of American elections. So October of 2016, a survey of registered voters, this is October of 2016, right, so a little while ago, 40% agree with the statement, I've lost faith in American democracy. So in the aftermath of the 2020 election, President-elect Joe Biden shared his view that faith in our institutions held. But commentators from outlets from The Economist, to The Washington Post, from Bloomberg, to NBC News, lamented the loss of faith in elections and need to restore faith. Politicians proposed new legislation, I trace some of this in my work, um, saying that we need to restore faith in elections. In 2021, there was a hearing from the Senate Judiciary Committee hearing, or committee, uh, with a hearing entitled Protecting a Precious, Almost Sacred Right on the Voting Rights Act. And Assistant Attorney General Kristen Clark testified at the hearing that the right to vote is sacred. I mean, these really only scratch the surface of the language of faith in elections, democracy, and the American ideal. Words that we use when someone questions the legitimacy of an election. And the language is everywhere. And words, of course, take on different meanings in different contexts. But the choice to use the word faith appears to deliberately invoke religious imagery. Words like trust, confidence, or belief could be used. But faith is perhaps just a synonym. But the religious imagery extends elsewhere. And there seems to be a stubborn insistence on using this word faith over other words. To where we're, we use elsewhere in government, but not as often. We might ask if there's faith in the courts or the presidency, um, but we hardly ever ask if we have faith in the Environmental Protection Agency or the Department of Motor Vehicles or the Fish and Wildlife Service, right? What is it about faith in elections that seems to be this recurring theme? Now, I'm not a linguist or a theologian or a philosopher, so those are three strikes against me right from where it go, but. <laughs> I am interested in thinking about how the courts have handled this issue because they do use the same word. And as a lawyer, I'm interested in what they're thinking about words of faith in elections. Both in the religious context, we think about faith, and in the political context. So how have they used this word faith? And should we be reluctant to use that word faith, both in the judicial context and for those in the religious context? So first, I want to think a little bit about the word faith. Um, I want to start in the, in the religious context, but even that word faith can have a lot of different meanings. Um, and I'll focus on three different ways of thinking about faith. Um, sociological, epistemological to mean belief, or epistemological to mean trust. So generically, maybe most simply, faith can take on the sociological meaning, that is, there are adherents of the Jewish faith, the Muslim faith, the Christian faith, right? There's some set of tenets or practices that mark someone as a member of that community. But in others, to think about this, and maybe the way we think about it more often, uh, is the epistemological meaning of belief, belief in some proposition. C.S. Lewis in Your Christianity describes this as one of the two ways that Christians think of faith. It is accepting or regarding as true the doctrines of Christianity because the evidence seems to him good or bad. The adherence to belief is based on good evidence. I teach evidence, so I think a little bit about the good and bad evidence. Lewis writes, now faith, in the sense in which I am here using the word, is the art of holding on to things your reason has once accepted, in spite of your changing moods. That's why faith is such a necessary virtue. Unless you teach your moods when they go off, you can never be either a sound Christian or even a sound atheist, but just a creature dithering to and fro with its beliefs really dependent on the weather and the state of its digestion. Uh, a very Lewis way of putting it. <laughs> Lewis describes, though, another way of thinking about faith, not just belief, but used it as we might think about it in the phrase faith in Christ. 
It's another epistemological claim, but this one is more like trust. That someone will do something, or that something will happen. Here, Lewis means that Christians have the ability to, or have the inability to achieve eternal salvation on their own power. They are acutely aware that they are incapable of living sinless lives. We discover their own bankruptcy. To have faith in Christ means we are, quote, creatures related to himself in a certain way. So this portrait of salvation at the heart of Christianity suggests that our identity is attached to someone outside of ourselves. We are reliant on the actions that another takes on our behalf. We recognize that we cannot act on our own. Eternal life is dependent on the actions of somebody else, and we have faith in this being, not simply because the evidence is strongest that it, this person exists, but because it is the only way for us to live. So we have these theological ways of using the word faith, grossly oversimplified. The theologians and philosophers in the audience may cringe, but <laughs> I'm now going to shift to thinking about democratic faith. And the use of the word faith in the context of democracy is actually nothing new among political theorists or scholars. In Democracy in America, Alexis de Tocqueville talks about how people of similar beliefs join together, that there are some principal ideas that society must share in order for a people to advance together toward common action. He turns to the faith that citizens have one another. The more equal the people are, for instance, the Tocqueville argues, the less faith they have in each other. But if they have, quote, almost unlimited confidence in the public, of the, in the judgment of the public, that is, when they're very different, they trust other people in that society. If the people of this society view themselves as equals with one another, it means they must have greater confidence in the judgments of the majority. He continues, if the United States, in the United States, the majority takes charge of providing individuals with a host of ready-made opinions and thus relieves them of the obligations to form for themselves opinions that are their own. A great number of theories and matters of philosophy, morality, and politics are adopted in this way by each person without examination on faith in the public. And if you look very closely, you'll see that religion itself reigns there much less as revealed doctrine than as common opinion. So here, de Tocqueville's talking about a couple ways to think about faith. First, confidence in the citizenry, confidence that the citizens have things right. And second, a sentiment of moral certitude in the direction of our country. And these two threads still hold up today. In his book, Constitutional Redemption, Professor Jack Balkan explains that the constitutional traditions have much in common with religious traditions, and especially religious traditions that feature a central organizing text that states the tradition's core beliefs. Professor Sandy Levinson's book, Constitutional Faith, explores this concept. Expressions of faith in the Constitution abound, including maybe most principally during Richard Nixon's impeachment hearings, Representative Barbara Jordan of Texas saying, my faith in the Constitution is whole, it is complete, it is total. This kind of confidence approaching how we, how we have democracy so there's this moral underpinning to the acts of government, a legitimacy that people are moving toward better things together. Professor Balkan frames this as the legitimacy of our Constitution, a matter that depends on our faith in the constitutional project. Because fidelity to the Constitution requires faith in the Constitution. That is, the legitimacy of the Constitution turns on the stories we tell ourselves about the direction that we as a people are going under it. Faith is used in the context of the narrative. Which direction are we going? Where are we as a people headed? In other words, democratic faith looks to the past, to the promises made, and looks to the future to determine whether those promises will be fulfilled. It is similar in some respects to the Christian religious tradition. An examination of the past, creation, the fall of man, the messianic promises, with an anticipation of the future, and an expectation of redemption and the things to come. Faith isn't just the doctrinal tenets of religious belief and practice, it is the whole story of past and future. Political theorists here use faith in this narrative sense, very much similar to the Judeo-Christian tradition. Now, this really only scratches the surface, and this lecture is not just about faith, but also thinking about elections. And courts have long used to love the phrase faith when talking about elections. So I'll talk about four places where they do that, three smaller and one I want to spend a little more time on. Um, first, the Supreme Court is occasionally considered allegiance to a political party as a kind of faith. In Nixon versus Condon, for instance, a white primary case from 1932, L.A. Nixon, a black prospective voter, was denied a ballot in the Texas Democratic primary election. 
Justice Benjamin Carozza's opinion looked at the Texas Democratic Party's definition of who could be a member. Whatever inherent power a state political party has to determine the content of its membership resides in the state convention, there platforms of principles are announced and the test of party allegiance was made known to the world. What is true in that regard of parties generally is true more particularly in Texas where the statute is explicit in committing to the state convention the formulation of the party faith. This faith, this attachment to a political party, appears to have fallen out of favor in the Supreme Court in recent years. They speak more about the association, the ideology, the preferences. So here, faith is being used in that sociological sense I mentioned earlier. But there are, I think, ways in which this, this use has fallen out of favor. Second, there's a phrase you might be familiar with known as faithless electors, to refer to those presidential electors in a presidential election who fail to vote for the candidate they are pledged to support. In presidential elections, after all, we don't formally directly elect the president. Each state appoints electors who go on to vote for the president in the electoral college and whoever receives a majority wins. They are usually, but not always, reliable. A North Carolina elector who pledged to support Richard Nixon in 1969, but then voted for George Wallace, prompted a congressional debate on the topic. Several electors voted for some candidate other than Donald Trump or Hillary Clinton in 2016. These electors we refer to as faithless because of a lack of fidelity. There's another kind of faith. Electors are expected to be loyal to the desire of the people who selected them. Those desires are manifest in the names of the president and vice president who are listed on the ballots, the candidates they were chosen to support. These electors look like something like a trustee, but really it's, I think, more than that. A trustee holds property in, 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 uh, for, the, for the benefit of somebody else. They hold a fiduciary duty to that beneficiary. They hold good faith and confidence. But we don't think of presidential electors doing those kinds of things, if we can name them in the first place. We don't think about them exercising any judgment whatsoever, and certainly not since 1796, when the electorate knew full well whether or not presidential electors were going to vote for John Adams or Thomas Jefferson. We expect these electors not to be sort of exercising their judgment, but to act as agents bound by the instructions of voters. So faithless has become something of a useful shortcut, but hardly invokes any of the traditional meanings we might think of as religious faith. Third, we expect legislators to act in good faith when they engage in redistricting. Now, good faith is a common expression in the law. In collective bargaining, we expect employers and representatives of employees to negotiate in good faith. If police obtain evidence from a defective search warrant, the evidence can be admitted to court under the Fourth Amendment if the police rely in good faith. The common law of contracts expects a duty of good faith in performing the contract. Faith in good faith is more about being faithful to one's duties and obligations. Those who act in good faith do so honestly. They lack malicious intent. In one of the Supreme Court's earliest one-person, one-vote cases, Reynolds versus Sims in 1964, the Supreme Court described the state's choices when it came to redistricting. By holding that the federal constitution requires both houses of the state legislature to be apportioned on a population basis, we mean that the Equal Protection Clause requires that a state make an honest and good faith effort to construct districts in both houses of its legislature as nearly of pop equal population as is practicable. That is, the legislature holds the responsibility to act with good intentions when it draws legislative districts. This doesn't really conjure up the epistemological sentiment of faith in elections. Good faith instead just reflects the court's belief, trust, expectation that legislatures will act appropriately. At the same time, there may be a relationship between the public's expectations of government and its confidence in elections. If the legislature is acting in good faith and behaving appropriately when it's drawing districts for who gets elected, the public is likely to trust the election results more generally. If it appears that the legislature is misbehaving and drawing maps in, uh, in its own behalf, one would expect confidence in elections to decline. And so it's here that I turn to sort of using this language of faith and democracy in the broadest sense. These last three categories are modest uses of the word faith in very discrete contexts, sociological or treating faith as a term of art. But much bigger is thinking about this phrase that I opened with, faith in democracy. It's used to identify the confidence of the public in elections and the absence of corruption in elected officials. 
a popular Supreme Court opinion describing faith in democracy actually arose outside of the election context. In 1961, the court examined a federal conflict of interest statute that prohibited government officials from negotiating deals that could benefit themselves as it might be inimical bull to the best interests of the general public. And the court defended this statute, writing, the statute is directed at an evil which endangers the very fabric of a democratic society. For a democracy is effective only if people have faith in those who govern. And that faith is bound to be shattered when high officials and their appointees engage in activities which arouse suspicions of malfeasance and corruption. The seriousness of this evil quite naturally led Congress to adopt a statute whose breadth would be sufficient to cope with the evil. Malfeasance and corruption shatter the faith of the people, of those who are being governed. And democracy can only be effective with faith. The court has used this in the campaign finance context when dealing with the amount of money that might be passing to campaigns or spent on elections. In thinking about the worries about corruption that come with large contributions, the court has explained leaving the perception of impropriety unanswered and the cynical assumption that large donors call the tune could jeopardize the willingness of voters to take part in democratic governance. Democracy works only if people have faith in those who govern. The Supreme Court used the same language in its 2010 decision, Citizens United versus Federal Election Commission, which held that the First Amendment prohibited the government from place, placing limitations on independent corporate expenditures on political speech. While these corporate expenditures were not coordinated with a candidate for office, the government expressed the concern that these expenditures would give rise to the appearance of corruption. That is, the government worried that the public would see sizable amounts of corporate spending and associate it with corruption. But the court held the appearance of influence or access, furthermore, will not cause the electorate to lose faith in our democracy. It's a claim about the future, a contested claim of that, but again reflects the court's concern that it is willing to worry about the people losing their faith in something. And uh, one more case I'll talk about. Uh, Justice Ginsburg, in, in her dissenting opinion, Republican Party of Minnesota versus White, worried about judicial candidates running for office and the codes of speech that were placed upon them. Prohibiting a judicial candidate from pledging or promising certain results if elected directly promotes the state's interests in preserving public faith in the bench. When a candidate makes a promise during a campaign, the public will no doubt perceive that she is doing so in hope of garnering votes, and the public will in turn likely conclude that when the candidate decides an issue in accord with that promise, she does so at least in part to discharge her undertaking to the voters in the previous election and to prevent voter abandonment in the next. She wondered how the public could have faith in the judiciary if the political promises around their election would affect their office as judge. In a related context, Justice David Souter lamented, in a single election in Illinois, the candidates raised a breathtaking $9.3 million. Justice-elect wondered, how can people have faith in the system? There are many more, but I will stop there I, and as, I, as I move to sort of the, the, the concluding thoughts. The language here suggests three ways of thinking about faith. The first is sort of maybe echoing this point of trust, right? That people trust their election officials to behave appropriately. The law should encourage that behavior. But it also reflects this sense of distrust. If there's an appearance of impropriety, a conflict of interest, or an exchange that looks like fraud, we should prevent even that appearance that our elected officials are behaving inappropriately, because that could undermine our trust in what they're doing. The second is an evidence-based claim that people have an expectation that their elected officials will behave appropriately. Evidence available to the public supports that view, including an expectation that officials do not receive bribes. They can't always see an election elected official's conduct. So they expect their officials to behave appropriately, and they will sustain these expectations until evidence is introduced, indicating that elected officials are engaged in malfeasance and corruption. Public displays of conduct including campaign finance, should demonstrate appropriate conduct. The third is a concept of faith in something, a proposition much closer to Lewis's second use of the term. That is, we have, as the, the people, a special relationship with our elected officials. We elect officials to represent us. They act in our interest and the best interests of the nation. They often act outside of our sight. We rely on them to work things out that benefit us. 
We trust in them to do the right thing for us, to abide by their promises, and to act in our best interest. And many of these things can sometimes be in tension or even contradict one another. The reactions from the justices in the Supreme Court, then, are more about democracy, a broader concern than just elections, but consistently arising in the context of elections. There is a persistent concern about the totality of representative government. It's a use consistent with this political narrative from the political theorists. Given the promises of the Constitution, we should expect some preservation of the good things of the past and some growth toward a better future. Some justices worry that these decisions or its decisions will undermine the promises of the future. Others are confident that the future will benefit the people consistent with the promises of the Constitution. And it might be that faith in democracy or elections means that people assume certain traits must exist for a democracy or an election to be there in the first place. A lack of corruption, the independent judiciary, whatever it might be. Perhaps in these traits there's no democracy, or perhaps there's nothing worth putting that faith in. So let me close with three suggestions about how we can think about faith in elections. The first is that it's not clear that the Supreme Court's invocations of faith, often in lofty and generic language, are terribly helpful. The court and litigants before the court and public commentators on elections should perhaps use more precise terminology to identify their concerns. Public trust in the good motives of elected officials, public assurance in the impartiality of judges, public confidence in the outcome of election results are the more specific interests that the court really intends to examine. The more specific you are as the court, the better it is for legislatures to think about when they're getting rules for elections. This kind of precision about the kinds of corruption or weaknesses in our democracy that legislatures need to address provides more accurate tools for lower courts to decide how to evaluate what the legislature is doing. Given the many ways we can use the word faith, um, it might be less accurate to use it when we can use a more precise one in some places. For another, it does risk conflating sacred terms with earthly ends. The language of faith is understandably powerful, undoubtedly used rhetorically to convey something very significant. Consistent with this, and on a much more skeptical note, Professor Maxwell Chibundu once wrote, democracy has become as bare an invocation of unexamined faith as any religious dogma. There are good practical reasons for promoting democratic societies, but it's dangerous to sanctify any ideology on the basis of the potential good that it may harbor. It's been popular to view democratic institutions as something sacred, and we are inclined to use sacred language like faith around them. Politicians or journalists may still prefer that language, but it might be time to move away from it. Courts have an important role to play in interpreting and applying public laws and adopting religious language as a gloss on worldly laws begins to tread on holy ground, to borrow a phrase. Second, regardless of the language we use, we are certainly witnessing a migration away from confidence in elections. Rather than merely hope that faith will be restored, we are seeing evidence to bring better, uh, or we're seeing efforts to bring better evidence to the public, precisely so the public does not need to rely on faith in things unseen. Uh, maybe we need a little more learn a little bit more from the Apostle Thomas, <laughs> but maybe we also need to uh, learn and acknowledge that elections, unlike the resurrection, are things to be run on sight and not by faith. Professor Rebecca Green has called for increasing transparency in how election observers witness the events of the canvas and the county of ballots, and the transparency of redistricting as authorities are drawing maps and explaining what results they get. Uh, Emily Rong Zhang has expressly called for bolstering faith with facts, a mechanism for shoring up popular support for independent redistricting commissions with algorithms that can provide the public with the information it needs to ensure that those redistricting commissions are working well and working effectively. Professor Rick Hassan has suggested increasing transparency of election results, including paper ballot requirements and risk limiting audits which increase public confidence that the process has yielded the correct outcome. It remains to be seen, of course, whether increased transparency, increased evidence is, are actually implemented, and if these are, whether public confidence is actually restored. But they undoubtedly reflect the notion, I think, that the status quo is inadequate for the present age. Finally, and this is more a recommendation for people of religious faith, and as a reminder to myself as much as anyone else, and here I turn again to the Christian tradition, Christians are called to respect the government and the ruling authorities. It doesn't take much effort for me to proof text that here. I think about Mark 12, 
Romans 13, 1 Peter 2. But it's worth recognizing the fallibility of democratic institutions as all worldly institutions. One might even expressly consider Psalm 146.3, put not your trust in princes in a son of man in whom there is no salvation. Consider the words of theologian Oliver O'Donovan in The Ways of Judgment, who shared three ways in which our own human political judgment is limited. Not everything known can be publicly expressed and certified. Judgment has only certain modes of expression open to it, and it lacks final authority. Simply put, there are always limitations to how well human institutions can work. To return to the notion of faith in something, our faith should be in Christ and not in the things of this world. That is something, I confess, of a gloomy note. <laughs> At least, gloomy to those whose trust is in the things of this world. But this is not designed to be some sort of fatalism for people of faith, a resignation that democratic institutions are inherently fallen. There are good reasons to work to root out fear in this world and to live worthy lives in this world. We are flesh and blood beings in this place at this time, and we need not be resigned to crumbling institutions around us. Reliable elections, both actually reliable and that the public perceives as reliable, can certainly redound to people of faith. Christians are called to submit to government authorities, and submission is undoubtedly easier in a legitimate regime and calls up fewer questions about obedience when one doubts that regime's legitimacy. And let us remember that we are called to fear not those who can kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. It's just simply a reminder that democratic institutions aren't perfect. Elections aren't flawless, but we can have confidence in them, at least as much as we can have confidence in worldly institutions. Elections in the United States have extensive checks, robust judicial review, and increasing transparency. I remain greatly optimistic about how excellent our elections are, how they are administered, how confident I am about their outcomes, and how much I anticipate the accountability in the process ahead of the next election for these politicians. You, or maybe not you, but someone, or many someones near you, may have serious questions about election administration in the United States. You may wonder whether it's fair and equitable, you may wonder whether it's run with the best interests of the voters in mind, the best interests of those in power, or the co-partisans of those running the election. You might wonder about the influence of corruption, or of corporations, of foreign governments, of the wealthy, of any number of other individuals in the system. These problems are not new. They were abiding concerns of the framers in that hot summer in Philadelphia. But as you wonder, I encourage you to test your claims rigorously. The strain we face comes from a public too easy to accuse, and too slow to examine, too quickly reading the headlines, and too rarely reading the text, too commonly listening to those who confirm their views, and too rarely from those who may challenge them. We as Christians have no fear in inquiry in our system of belief. So let us rise to see if we can test our doubts in elections and see if we might not find that epistemological trust that our elections are strong, secure, and resilient. Thank you so much. Love to open it for questions now. So if you have a question, go ahead and ask. And we have about 15 minutes. Yeah, thank you very much. That was really, really interesting. Um, so I mean, we we have a pluralistic society, almost. and you mentioned a Tocqueville, and I have read him long ago. But uh, well, yeah, well, even uh, Thomas Jefferson, who uh, neither he nor Tocqueville, Tocqueville were, were really you know, Christians, uh, and so but. Uh, they both, I, I, as I understand it, you can comment on that, you know, uh, felt that America works. You know, to talk those trying to compare the French Revolution with the American Revolution and understand why things went differently. And, uh, you know, they, they both felt that, uh, you know, the, the, the influence of Christianity, real, you know, believers in the country made a big difference. You know, I mean, to talk a lot of people said, you know, America's a church, that's why it worked. And uh, so, um, what do you think about that? I mean, because even then, even back in the, in the early days of the country, Christians were really a minority. And so, what do you think? I mean, That's a big question. Uh, <laughs> I, I, th I think about a couple of things. Right. 
first, for a very long time, I think there's been some question, and especially I, I think about what we might describe as sort of nation building, or you think about whether it's sort of the, the global war on terror and the Iraq war, you think about the sort of post-Soviet countries or whatever it might be. There's long been questions throughout the world. First, an assumption that we're going to have democracies. And then second, like what is the stuff we need that's going to be sufficient to help those democracies thrive and flourish, right? And um, it has seemed that not, not all democracies are being created equal, or that they're able to sort of sustain or, or sort of flourish in the same way. Part of that is the skepticism of the people that have come out of, out of a previous ruling regime and the sort of inability to transition to a new one. Uh, and then there are questions about what, is it some other sentiment or other kinds of um, beliefs among the people. So again, here I'm thinking about what De Tocqueville's thinking about again very much. It's like the United States is a I'll use, I'll use a scare quotes, Christian nation, if you will, thinking about sort of the influences upon many, although certainly not all, maybe you know, never, never the predominant, uh, or at least in a, in a particular sectarian view of, of the world. Um, but that, that just is sort of highlighting that whenever democracies are formed or created, there are you know, innumerable unique elements to each of them that are sort of influencing them and figuring out whether or not they're gonna thrive and survive. But I think maybe, at least in the United States more specifically, it's hard for me to think about the comparative context as much. Um, we are certainly not just on the, on the religious side, but really in everything, experiencing what people describe as the hollowing out of institutions, right? We don't have as many intermediary institutions, or as Catholics would use the phrase subsidiarity. We don't have civic organizations as much that we're a part of. You can describe the church attendances dwindle. You can, you know, we can go from reading bowling alone to you know, whatever sort of kinds of things of thinking about these things are that have suggested that we really now have an increased distrust in a lot of the people around us because of our inability to spend time with or be around other people. So I think the religious component is, is one of those. That is, if church attendance is high and people are in community and perhaps have faith in similar things and similar religious backgrounds, that helps. But even any kind of conversation or dialogue in social settings or social circles or intermediate institutions also kind of helps flourish things. And de Tocqueville spends a lot of time talking about this too, about those civic organizations. So all that is to say, in a very roundabout way maybe, of talking about it, um, you know, the conditions in the United States for a very long time, and I think part of that is the Christian tradition, have helped democracy flourish. It's not that Christianity, I think, is essential to democracy, but I think that it is a component of the kinds of things that worked very well as a people flourishing, a civic society, a political, not in a partisan sense, but a political society sort of engaged. And as we move away from that into more, what you describe as individualism or, um, in the negative, maybe more isolationism from these sorts of activities. Again, a whole host of areas beyond just sort of church going. Um, I think it has driven some of the concerns that I've talked about and some of the, the, the concerns that we have here. Um, even as we think about political parties, we might have strong partisanship in the United States, but we have very low affinity with our political parties. Maybe not in Iowa at the caucuses, but uh, in most of the rest of the country, most of the rest of the time. Um, so I think it's been. It, it, I think the religious aspect of the United States certainly had an important aspect of thinking about these these ways that we build community and have civic organizations. But I think there's been a, a hollowing out in a whole host of uh, of those ways beyond just thinking about Christianity itself. Yeah. Uh, here's another big question. <laughs> That's what I'm here for today. The big ones. <laughs> Fred's question. Mm -hmm. um, I, I wonder if, if you have any reflections on uh, trends in um, contemporary Christian, uh, among Christian groups and in Christian theology that are um, inimical to democracy, sometimes quite explicitly. So, and to bring it a little bit close to home, I mean, a, a prime example of this is the work of, um, of uh, Rush Dooney, who, is a, who was a Calvinist, um, who is explicitly antagonistic toward uh, 
democracy as being, in his view, uh, antithetical to the biblical, um, the biblical word of God. Yeah, um, you know, I, I, let me offer. I know this is being recorded. That's okay. I'll, I'll offer my own, like, one of my own little things that I think about. Every Fourth of July, I become more of a monarchist <laughs> in the sense that I think, like. Would I have actually been in the revolution or would I have been a Tory ab abiding with whatever the British were doing? I know that's anathema to most people, but it makes me think at least, do I value the system I'm in because I'm in it, as opposed to like reflecting on the hard choices that people have made in other points in time in their places? Now, that's adjacent to your, your question, which is does the biblical dictate some kind of government or some kind of like way and thinking about like, oh, is democracy the wrong form of government and some sort of anti-Christian form of government? Um, to me, right, we see a whole lot in scripture about our submission to authorities um, and not a whole lot about what that sort of form ought to be. And I think that particularly we're supposed to be submitting to uh, a Caesar that was not particularly uh, sympathetic uh, to the view, and again, not even a monarchy, a very different system of thinking about government, if you're thinking about the Roman uh, situation. Uh, we saw that God was not particularly pleased with a monarchy, uh, as we saw in Judges in the Book of Kings. Uh, so it's very, like, there, there are so many things about government itself and how government is formed, that at least in my view, but I don't see scripture saying a whole lot about, you know, one particular way or another. Now, that's not to say that to the extent that there are people or some Christian uh, you know, traditions or arguments to say that there's a particular theological necessity of having a system of governments in, and governance in place that is or is not democracy. Um, you know, my, my response to them is, I think you're wrong, but I don't know, I don't know that how, how else I address that except to point out uh, again, the sort of panoply of governmental structures placed in scripture, uh, the call to submit to them, and then in my judgment, the practical wisdom that we have at any given moment in time um, to say, we are abiding within the system, we are supposed to submit to the authority, and we are going to do the very best we can, given the situation we find ourselves in to submit. And the fact that we are here in a, in a democracy and not in a dictatorship or a monarchy or whatever it might be in another part of the world, um, we very well might find ourselves submitting, or we very well might find ourselves um, you know, trying to work within using the practical wisdom given to us to try to figure out how to make it better. Um, that doesn't really directly address the claims to say that if people show up, if there are Christians of those who show up and say, I have a particular way of thinking about how government ought to be or must be, um, I don't know that I particularly have a great answer for that <laughs> if that's the case. Yeah. Yeah, um, you, you had uh, mentioned that having faith in the elections and not corruption is really important for the public. And uh, one of the things I think about is, you know, with voter ID, you have one side that says, well, the elections is corrupted because you have making it too restrictive, and the other side saying, no, it's corrupted because it's not restricted enough. How does the U.S. stack up, and then what are your personal thoughts on that? Um, the, the metaphor I've that someone has used, that I now use when it comes to voter ID, if we want to pick a very particular example. Uh, voter ID, it's uh, two bald men fighting over a comb, <laughs> which <laughs> is, that is, I mean, if you look at, for instance, the, 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 there have been some systematic studies shown about this, um, and try and say, like, what effect does voter identification have? Um, does it actually increase public confidence? There's actually competing evidence about that. Some people think that it actually diminishes confidence because once you're showing the ID, you're starting to raise questions about legitimacy and, con and, and, and trust. There's some other evidence that suggests that it enhances confidence because people feel pretty good about doing it. Does it, does it diminish voter turnout? We would expect to see a, a whole lot more than the studies we've seen so far. Maybe at the very margins, it has diminished voter turnout in some elections, depending on the studies you read. But in terms of the meta study, it suggests it doesn't really change the turnout. Has it actually reduced fraud in elections? It's not. You know, you would actually maybe expect turnout to diminish if you thought there were lots of fraudulent ballots being cast in the past. And now with an ID, people show up, and so there's there's a lot of. Uh, a lot of uh, fighting about something that, in my judgment, 
I kind of shrug at, which again makes me um, unusual in the field, maybe, <laughs> to say, you know, I, mean, I, I might have my own personal inclinations or predilections. I probably am uh, more inclined not to change whatever law you have than to change it and move in favor or against it. Um, but it's also a very hard conversation to have because undoubtedly it affects things at the margins. There's no question you can find a case somewhere where somebody has illegitimately cast a vote in person or somebody is unable to cast a vote because they lack the ID, right? You can always find those things. And it's a system of trade-offs. Whenever you are doing these things, it's a system of trade-offs. So trying to figure out where you are and like what level of stuff you need or evidence you need to sort of change it or move in one direction or another, it's been a very, very hard question for me to engage and confront because it has just sort of devolved into an unfortunate kind of tribalism, if you will. Um, and again, I don't think it needs to be that way. Uh, and I try not to have conversations that continue to perpetuate that, but that's a very hard thing for me to do. Um, other times I feel like there's good evidence, and I'll talk about the things that I, where I feel like there's good evidence talking about things. You know, I was involved in a recount here in Iowa, and I can say, the machines are very good, very reliable. I can talk about you know all, whatever, whatever you want to talk about. There are some things I feel like I have a much greater sense of the reliability and confidence to be able to speak on these things, thinking about the evidence that you have. Um, but then when you're talking to people, it it really is one-on-one -on -one conversations with people, changing hearts and minds. Um, and, and I don't have a cable news audience to be able to change their minds, so it's a, <laughs> it's a very different set, set of nature of conversations. Yeah. Um, Thank you so much for the lecture and many insightful things. And, and one of which was, um, I never really thought about this before, but faith in democracy and faith in elections, sort of under the lens of a, of a promise. And you know, when you think about a promise, if a promise is going to be made, two things have to happen. The person that's promising, they have to commit themselves to that course of action, which is, is sort of the good faith you talked yeah. about. But, but it's also the case that if you make a promise, you have to be able to actually carry out what you're what you're promising, and in that sense, I, I wonder if on top of the good faith issues, uh, maybe a distrust that, that what's being committed actually will be done and carried out. Um, do you think there, there's also a disconnect between maybe what people expect in terms of, of the promise they think that democracy and faith or uh, democracy and elections are making, and the actual ability to carry that out? Um, with respect to these these institutions and processes, oh, great. I mean, I think because because I think about I spend much more of my time thinking about the election component than sort of the the broader and again this is sort of the future oriented like what happens when you win an election or your elected representatives are serving in office, right? Are they able to fulfill? the promises they've made to you. And again, not even in the campaign promise sense, but in a very abstract, they are going to act on the, in the best interests of the nation, or they are going to sort of move us forward toward the goals that we think are, are necessary to sort of improve as a society, whatever it might be. Um, and there's no question that the people of the United States at this point <laughs> um, have less faith that that is happening, right? That, that the elected officials are able to move through their visions. Um, now, not at the state level, I should, I should be careful about that, because I think at the state level, I think people tend to be pretty pretty comfortable with the direction of their legislature. They might be the minority, but, but uh, you know, the, there, there tends to be a close resemblance to it. Um, at the federal level or at the national level, it's just been a very different matter because of, uh, for a number of reasons, the constraints of the Constitution, the unique components of, uh, of, of uh, congressional action, uh, the, the, the limitations placed upon the executive, the limitations of judicial review in the federal courts a whole host of reasons that, that make that promise less likely to be carried out. Um, but I think that then it turns around in and of itself that um, you will occasionally see the surveys about your confidence in the election before election day and after election day. Um, and people's confidence like dramatically changes only based on the outcome of the election. <laughs> um, you know, you'll ask people, is it a good economy or bad economy? And Republicans and Democrats will have one answer before the election, and then they'll have a different answer after the election, right? So there's also a different kind of, um, and I don't want to say it's bad faith, uh, but a sort of Rorschach approach or reaction to what has just occurred to sort of color the lens of what they think is also happening at the legislative level. So the promise, even if we're not looking objectively at like what the legislature is doing, there's a difference in which we think if our side wins, 
we have we, we feel much better about whatever is happening anywhere, like regardless of whether or not things are happening. The economy's great, the economy's terrible. Inflation's great, inflation's terrible, through that sort of lens. So um, it's hard to nail down the promise that <laughs> people have to think about it, how it carries out when people's priors are so coded toward this, again, sort of partisan tribalism, whatever it might be. Thank you so much. It's a real pleasure to be here and present. I'm, a, I'm, I'm happy to stick around and chat with people. Uh, you, some of you, you're asking hard questions, and I don't have easy answers for you, but I really appreciate the, the opportunity and look forward to, to, to continuing the series next week. Yeah, thank you so much.